Welcome to First Grapevine, a United Methodist Church. We're glad you have joined us for worship in person or online. Please take a moment and register your attendance by either filling out one of the registration cards or online through our church website, firstgrapevine.org, or our mobile app. Good morning. My name is Deb Shivey, and I'd like to tell you about my favorite week of the summer, which is Feed Our Kids Big Week. Feed Our Kids is a grassroots program that began in 2005 as a partnership between our community and Grace. A small group of moms wanted to fill the gap during the summer weeks when kids who were on free or reduced lunch programs were out of school. The program began by serving a couple apartment complexes in Grapevine and has grown to serve six locations including our own Grapevine Village with over 37,000 lunches each year. Along with the lunch, Feed Our Kids volunteers do arts and crafts, read books, and play with our neighborhood kids during the long, hot summer days. Our church became involved back in 2005 by helping with one site, and our involvement quickly grew. During the week of June 27th, Big Week will happen at First Grapevine, and we will be at all six sites each day. Then for the next three weeks, we will continue Feed Our Kids at our Grapevine Village. When I think about Feed Our Kids Big Week, I think about kindness, compassion, and caring. What I love most about Feed Our Kids Big Week is coming together as a community of faith, coming together as children of God to shine light in the part of a community that so desperately needs it. We invite you to come join us during this special time. So what does it take to make Feed Our Kids happen? We need tons of volunteers to help, plan and shop for almost 4,000 lunches, work in the kitchen to prep, work in the Family Life Center to pack those lunches, head out to the sites to serve, clean it all up, and set it up for the next day. Well, who are our volunteers? They're moms and dads, grandparents and singles, teens and tweens, and kids just big enough to open up a bag and drop in a snack. Many of our volunteers are church members, but it's a great time to invite your friends to come and help. How does our church help support this ministry? Feed Our Kids takes about $10,000 worth of food. No surprise if you've been to the grocery store lately. We've been so thankful for our church's support of Feed Our Kids with both financial donations and food to go in those lunch bags. In fact, today we'll have a donation station set up after each service. Please stop by to see what we need and how you can help. Big Week is a really special time in the church. Uh, it's a great way for us to connect with our Grapevine Village elementary and middle school campuses. And it's also a great way to show people, um, visitors and otherwise, uh, what we're all about. We're really excited for it. It's the last week of June and we're, we're hoping we can get some of our youth and our young adults and our families involved. Um, it's going to be a great way to be a part of our Grapevine community here. Finally, Big Week takes intentional prayer as we pray for this ministry to bless the families we serve with lunch and the example of Christ who told us in Matthew 25 that when we serve the least of these, we are serving Him. I hope that you'll join us this summer as we work together to feed our kids. Good morning, everybody. So everything looks a little different in here this morning. First of all, from my point of view, on Pentecost Sunday, I would expect to see a lot more green, but I'm looking out and I see a lot of blue and a lot of red, thanks to the Rangers game after this. So we're all looking forward to a good time going out of the Rangers game. And then the other side is me instead of Josh. Uh, Josh this week is in California. He's working with the camp for underprivileged kids, and uh, we're real proud of him uh, doing that out there. But if you would this morning, please stand with me and sing. This first song is Build Your Kingdom Here. Come set your rule and reign in our hearts again. Increase in us, we pray. Unveil why we're made. Come set our hearts ablaze with hope like wildfire in our very souls. Holy Spirit, come invade us now. Cause we are your church and we need your power in us we seek your kingdom first
kind of a new one for you. Uh, this is one we've been doing in the Family First service, uh, one Jenny introduced to me, and uh, she's going to sing this one for us. This one's called My Lighthouse.
Y'all sound great. Y'all sound great too. <laughs> it's good to be with you this morning. My name's Carly. I'm a pastor here. And today's Pentecost Sunday. That's the day that we celebrate the church. Yeah, y'all can sit down or stand up. I don't really care. Uh, it's a day that we celebrate the church. We've got 96 roses up front here, and that represents the 96 people that have joined our church within the last year. And as of this morning, that number is short. We've had more people join today. So we celebrate that, and we celebrate the work that God is doing. So I'll invite you to, into a spirit of prayer. If you'll take a deep breath, and let us pray. Holy God, we're grateful for your presence with us this morning, and we're grateful that you meet us here in worship. Some of us come, God, with excitement and joy in our hearts about the summer that's to come with things happening in our lives, and we thank you that you rejoice and celebrate with us in that. And some of us come here with troubled hearts, with anxiety, with things going on, and God, we know that you know those things too that you sit with us in the hard times, and that you transform us, and that you transform situations. It's our prayer that as we sing, and as we listen, and as we pray, uh, that you would be with us, and that you would make your presence known so that we can go out and be the body of Christ to a world in need. We pray over this offering, and all the ways that we offer ourselves to you this week, that you would make them worthy. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.
And now it's time for children's time. If we could get all the kids to come down front. Hi, guys. Good morning. Hi, hi. <laughs> guys is everybody good is everybody loving summer yeah <laughs> all right hi guys all right i have got something cool to show you guys in a minute but first i wanted to ask you something so can y'all help me think of things that are better when you have more people what are things that are better when you have more people what do you think Duck, duck, goose. Duck, duck, goose. That's a good one. What do you think? I was going to say games. Yeah, games. What else? Oh, gosh, I just forgot. <laughs> it's okay. What do you think, Leah? What's better with more people? Sports. Sports, yeah. Okay, so what about, oh, what else? Church. Church. Okay, good idea. You stole my answer. All right, so there's a lot of things that are better with more people, aren't there? You've got, what do you think, Corey? Parties, that's another thing I was thinking. Tag, yes. Okay, so there's lots of things that are better with more people, right? So why are these things better when you have more people? What makes a party more fun with more people? What? It's because you can get more things. You maybe, if it's your birthday, you get more presents? Yes, that is very true. What else? There are different, like there are different people with different ideas of kind of like what fun is, and you kind of get to explore different activities and different ideas, I guess. Yeah, I love that. You get to like know all these different people and like have fun in different ways with different people, right? What else? It'll be better for party games. And party games, yes. All right, so what about, oh, thank you. I'm going to put this right here for now. All right, so what about like a choir? Some of y'all are in our kids' mm -hmm. choir. It sounds so beautiful, and the more kids that are there, the more beautiful it sounds, right? And, like, maybe, have you ever had to do a project or, like, a job, and it was better when you had more people? Like, if you had to, like, clean the playroom or clean something, and it was just easier when there was more people there because you had more hands to help? No? You want to do it yourself? See, I'm a little bit that way, too. I'd kind of want to do it myself and make sure it gets done 
the way I want, right? Sometimes things are better on your own, but sometimes things are better with a big group. So um, I want you to think about that while I tell you this story about way, way, way long ago. It was right after Jesus had died, not long after, and Jesus' followers were, they had this big job of sharing the stories of Jesus with the whole world. That's a really big job. And they didn't have a lot of people to do it. They were getting more people all the time, but it wasn't enough to spread it for the whole world. That's a really big job. So um, they were kind of feeling maybe, I don't know for sure, but I think if I was them, I would be feeling kind of sad. I might be feeling kind of nervous. I might be kind of feeling like, see this droopy balloon that I have? This is a really sad looking balloon, right? This is not the happiest balloon on the block. So That maybe is how they were feeling, like, this is a really big job, and we'll never be able to do it, and we don't know what to do. Well, God knew that that's what they were going to feel, right? Because God knows us really, really well. And so um, God decided he was going to send a helper, all right? So God sends a helper called the Holy Spirit. Have you ever heard that word before, the Holy Spirit? It's kind of a hard thing. We don't always know exactly what people are talking about when we talk about the Holy Spirit, but I'm going to give you a little example of what he's like, okay? So I do have a towel. I know a lot of times I have to bring a towel in here because I do things that are kind of be a little bit messy. We're going to try not to make a mess, but you just never know. So they, God sent the Holy Spirit to all of Jesus' followers, and the Holy Spirit gave them something amazing. He gave them the power to speak in new languages that they had never spoken before. Have you ever tried to learn a new language? It is really hard. I know some of you guys learn languages in school. You learn Spanish. It's not easy, is it? It's not easy to learn a new language. And they didn't even have to learn it. The Holy Spirit gave them the power to speak it. And what do you think they could do with those new languages? What could they do, Quinn? Maybe go, like, talk to other people that they Yeah, they could go to new places and talk to new people in these new languages, right? So I'm going to have Robert help me. Robert, can you help me for a second? Can you hold? It's okay. Can you hold this microphone for me? Hold it right up here to my face. Okay, so stand right over here. All right, so I've got my balloon, and we're going to see what happens if we add something like the Holy Spirit. All right? Look at that. The balloon's spilling up, isn't it? And the Bible said that the people who were there, I don't think it's going to pop. You don't have to plug yours. Well, it might. I don't really know. All right, so the Bible said that the people who were there were filled with the Holy Spirit. Just like this balloon is getting filled up with the gases made from that baking soda and vinegar reaction, right? So look now. Much happier balloon. It's not so droopy anymore. The Holy Spirit filled them up, I'm going to hold on to it, okay, and gave them the power to do amazing things that they never knew that they could do. Thank you. And so that's what they felt like, and they were excited, and they had this new energy and this new hope and this new belief that they could do amazing things. And I want you guys to know that even though this story is from a long time ago, the Holy Spirit is not just from a long time ago. The Holy Spirit is with us today. The Holy Spirit is with you. You're never too young to share God's love with other people, are you? You guys can all do that. And I've seen you guys do it, so I know you can. And so I want you to remember, just like this balloon, you guys can be filled with the Holy Spirit, and you can do amazing things to share God's love. All right? Does that sound good? All right, let's pray. Dear God, thank you so much for this day. Thank you for these friends who are here with us and our friends who are watching from home. God, I just thank you so much for sending your Holy Spirit to us. Thank you for giving us help when we need it to do the jobs that you give us. And God, thank you so much for the love that you have for us. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, thanks, guys. It's always good to see all the kids coming forward and having a time of, uh, where they get to learn and where they get to experience worship. So today's Pentecost, uh, that's the day that we celebrate the church. It's a very special day for many reasons. Uh, today our church is celebrating baptisms, uh, and worldwide we have people celebrating that all 
uh, across all churches in all different countries. Uh, today is Pentecost. Uh, this is also a special day for me in particular. It's the day that I came to meet you all in 2019. Pentecost Sunday was my first day. I And we had a tailgate. Uh, we had a party, we had a worship service, and I got to meet so many of you that I now know as friends, that I now know as my church family. And I can remember after I, the, just after I started, I, I think it was like the first week, and the newness was kind of settling down. I was still meeting people, but I was starting to get into a routine, and I realized I had no idea what I was doing. Um, it was my first, this is my first full-time pastor job. And so I was learning the ropes, and I uh, decided I would go into Pastor Travis's office, and I asked him very shyly. He was about to go on vacation for a week. And so I said, what do you want me to do? And not in a, hey, what do you need me to do for you while you're gone on vacation kind of thing, but no, what am I supposed to be doing? In this church, we've talked a lot about the book of Acts over the last three years. I think four or five times we've preached on it. We've talked about it in Bible study. We've had conversations in meetings and on podcasts. And something that seems to, be, seems to be circling back around. And I think in a world where there's so many things in a state of unrest, there's so many things that are unknown, so many things causing grief and anger, it's probably a good idea for us to remember our mission and to kind of recalibrate toward who we are and what we're called to do. I mentioned, I think, a few weeks ago, this is the first book of the Bible that I ever read in its entirety when I first started uh, taking the Bible seriously because it's the acts of the church, the acts of the disciples who followed Jesus, what they did after he was gone. So it all starts 50 days after Easter, so the disciples had seen the resurrection of Christ, his death and resurrection. And if this story is new to you or it's been a while, all the people of the church, all the religious people in the area were gathered in Jerusalem for a religious festival. Remember, they're all, there are no Christians at this time. There are people who are Jewish and there are people who are Jewish and they follow Jesus, but they're no Christians. And so that comes later. People kind of named us Christians. We didn't name ourselves and so it's not even two months after they've experienced this traumatic event where they've uh, watched their, their leader, their rabbi, their teacher, their savior die, resurrect, and then go off to heaven. And they're trying to figure out what are our next steps. They're kind of in this liminal space where they're tr trying to be faithful. And they're scared, right? That's what Monica said. They're scared. They're trying to figure out what's, what to do next. They don't want what happened to Jesus to happen to them, but yet they're following this urge, this command that God's given them to go and spread the good news, right? There's that tension. And I think if we want to claim that it's a hard season for us with coming out of COVID, going into the summer, with everything going on in the world, if we want to say it's a hard season for us, it was also a hard season for the disciples, so as they're gathered for this festival, it sounds like a rushing wind comes in. And all of a sudden, the people in this crowded space spoke as if with tongues of fire. These people who couldn't understand each other because they were speaking other languages, all of a sudden could understand each other. And then Peter, the same guy who denied knowing Christ, the same guy who said, no, I don't know him. No, I don't know him. No, I don't know him. Stands up. And gives the first Christian sermon. He explains that what they just experienced, this mighty rushing wind, was an act of God. That they weren't drunk, even though it was nine in the morning. That it was the Holy Spirit, just like God said he would send. And so after, as Peter gets done explaining this and giving his sermon, the disciples ask a question. And it's the same question I asked Pastor Travis. So what do we do? And in, in the end of Acts chapter 2, Peter replies, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The promise is for you and your children and for all who are far off, for all whom the Lord our God will call. 
With many other words, he warned them and he pleaded with them, save yourselves from this corrupt generation. Those who accepted this message were baptized and about 3,000 were added to their number that day. So if the question is, what do we do? The answer is repent and be baptized. And that's kind of a hard thing to say nowadays, uh, because usually when we talk about repentance, it's someone saying, repent, like rebuking you for something you've done or saying they're disappointed in you. But the word metanoia, that's the, that's the translated word, metanoia. It just means turn. Repentance is just turning, reorienting, to shift. And that can be a hard pill to swallow, or it can be something that's really liberating. When we turn toward Christ, we're turning away from evil. We're turning away from the things that separate us from God, the wickedness in our lives. And we're pledging allegiance to the one we turn toward. And today we're going to give you an opportunity to do that either for the first time or as a renewal. So I'm telling you what we're going to do later so you're not shocked. So after the message, we'll have an opportunity for those who want to be baptized for the first time to come forward and to celebrate with you in that choice. And then after that, we're going to have renewal of baptisms. In, so in our church tradition, a lot of churches do this a different way, but in our church, the Methodist church, we say that when you're baptized, when the first time you're baptized, God got it right. It's more about what God's doing than what you're doing anyway. And so we don't re-baptize, but you can renew your baptism. And that's something you can do as often as you like, as often as you touch the waters, as often as you take a shower, as often as you swim in a lake, you can renew your baptism. And so the way that we do that in our church is we do a few ways. We can sp- sprinkle some water on your head, or we can, uh, we've got a dunk, it's not a dunk paper, I keep saying that. Oh, a tr- we've got a trough out here. Uh, trough is probably not the right word either. It's clean. It's not like a feeding trough. We've got a, tr- we've got a trough of water if you'd like to be fully immersed. Uh, so that's coming up. If that's something that's interesting to you, that appeals to you, whether for the first time or the first time in a while, uh, you're going to have the opportunity to do that later. So if you're being thinking about it, sprinkle or dunk. You got, you got your options. But baptism is the way that we're initiated into Christ's family. As, and in the United Methodist Church, we say that when you're baptized, you're not just baptized into this church. You're not just baptized into the Methodist Church. You're baptized into the worldwide church of all the people who have ever called themselves Christian. And we get to be part of that family. You know, we... Often we'll pray the Lord's Prayer. We don't do that in this service very often, but we do in other services. And Pastor Alan mentioned today, you know, there are people all over the world that are praying this prayer all day today as they go to church. And what a gift in all different languages. And what a gift it is that we get to be part of that. So baptism is one of two rituals that we do in the Methodist Church uh, that we call sacraments. Some churches have more, some have none. Uh, But most have two, baptism and communion. And there are these means of grace, these ways that God speaks to us. And I love that they're tangible acts. We, at the family first service, we have communion and we have baptism. And these kids aren't old enough to speak yet. But they're learning when they place the bread in their mouth or when they have the water sprinkled on them. They are getting a sense of ritual and that meaning will come later that they have been part of God's family since before they could know it. And so when we receive communion, we each receive a little piece of bread from one loaf because we're one body in Christ. And for a moment and for a few hours, we each have that little piece of Christ inside of us and we're all connected in that way. And when we make the decision to be baptized or our parents make that decision for us, We're doing what billions of other people have done, receive the water, cleansing ourselves and making ourselves new as as a new creation. There's nothing in this life besides baptism, besides God, that can make us new. And it demonstrates God's power and forgiveness. So often I think we carry around our shame and our guilt and our hurt 
and the things we've done and we let that just become a normal part, it becomes a weight that we just carry all the time. But when we have new life in Christ, we're forgiven and we're unshackled by that burden and we get to live differently. After I was born, my parents made the decision to baptize me as an infant. As my sponsors, they brought me forward and they said, we will raise Carly to follow Jesus until she can make that decision for herself. And the community of faith at First Glen Rose United Methodist Church said, we will raise Carly until she can make that decision for herself to follow Jesus. And that's what I did. I remember in fifth grade, my pastor asking me if I accepted Jesus as my Lord and Savior. I remember these things, but my baptism didn't really become real to me until high school. I went on a mission trip. It was my first one out of state to Vivian, Louisiana. We went with different churches. I was from a small church, and it was a really hard week for me. We were doing home repairs and building stuff, but uh, the people I was working with, we didn't really get along. There was some bullying that went on, which looking back, probably isn't a big deal, but, you know, when you're a teenager, it really can consume you. When you're spending days with people and they're not nice, it can really be hurtful and it can really impact you. And I can hardly explain it. Like, I was trying, I was reflecting back on this experience, and it's hard for me to explain, but God used that situation for good. Because in that moment, it was in that week, it was like the Holy Spirit picked me up and literally turned me and set me on a path where I was only focused on God for the first time in my life. Like it's, I, I felt like I could feel God's presence in that thick Louisiana air. I, was re- I started reading my Bible, started sincerely praying on my own. And you know what? It didn't fix my problems that week. I, I, it didn't fix the problems I had with my team members, but it gave me a new perspective. And it instilled this fire in me that God was the only thing that mattered. God was the only one I was trying to please. God was the only one that was worth having a relationship with. It was after that that I started actually thinking and acting through a lens of faith, not just as an afterthought, but as the way I did things. And it was this conscious choice I made to follow God that reflected back 15 years before when my parents said, we're going to raise Carly until she can follow Jesus on her own. The thing is, all that was required of me was a yes. God did the rest. There's a quote that I was studying when I was getting ready for my ordination exams. So it's either by John Wesley or someone who really liked John Wesley. Uh, But it says, God's grace is more than enough for all of us, but it requires our participation. In other words, when we're baptized or when we baptize our kids, it's this big, it's a big deal. It's something you pray about, that you consider thoughtfully, that you talk to your family about. But even more so in that act, in that decision of becoming, of being baptized is God's decision and God's work and God's grace. It's like the tip of the iceberg is what we say and when we decide to be baptized and the rest is what God is doing. And God's grace was already present in your life whether that's as an infant or as an adult. So that's what we're celebrating when someone's baptized, the work of God in their life. And it doesn't end there. Sometimes we think about baptism as kind of the finish line of faith, like, you know, I decided I would become baptized, and that was it. But really, it's just the beginning. It's where God enters into our lives in a conscious moment, and we get, we begin to work with God, and we begin to let this Holy Spirit do her work. You know, every church tradition uses different words like elder and deacon and pastor and minister, uh, but the way our church works, the Methodist church works, is that anyone who has been baptized is a Christian minister. I want you to hear that again. By your baptism, you are a minister. You are called to let God work through you and to be Christ's hands and feet. 
You know that day I went into Pastor Travis's office and asked him, what do I do? His answer was, go build relationships. And our commission as Christians is similar, to go and make disciples, baptizing in the name of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. What a better way to celebrate the church by going and doing and letting the Holy Spirit work in you. So if there's something in you today that's saying yes to God, that's saying, yes, I want to follow God, yes, I'm curious about what God might do in my life, you don't have to have all the answers. Like in the song we sang, in my questions, in my doubt, your truth will hold. It rhymed, but it went something like that. And so I'm going to invite the band to come back up. And as they're doing so, if you'd like to be baptized for the first time, I want you to come up and we'll do that. And then afterwards, I invite anyone and everyone, I hope everyone who's been baptized will come up to renew your baptism. Uh, If you want to be sprinkled, we'll do that here. If you want to be dunked, come up anyway and we'll uh, we'll announce it, we'll introduce you to everyone and then we'll... uh, go out afterwards. But first, let us pray. God, you are a God of grace and a God who works in mysterious ways. As we prepare to baptize and renew our baptisms, fill us with courage to make that decision. Not because it's about our works or our doing, but because we want to say yes to what you're doing in our lives. By baptism, you make us ministers and we hold that title humbly. God, fill us with your Holy Spirit so that we may go out into the world to share your love with those who need it. Amen. At this time, if you'd like to be baptized for the first time, will you come forward? This is William Joseph Norton. William's going to be baptized, so I, uh, I'll extend this to you. Siblings in Christ, through the sacrament of baptism, we are initiated into Christ's holy church. We are incorporated into God's mighty acts of salvation and given new birth through water and the spirit. Through confirmation, throughout the reaffirmation of our faith, we renew the covenant declared at our baptism, acknowledging that what God is doing for us and affirm our commitment to Christ's holy church. William, on behalf of the whole church, I ask you, do you renounce the spiritual forces of wickedness, reject the evil powers of this world and repent of your sin? If so, say I do. Do you accept the freedom and power God gives you to resist evil, injustice and oppression in whatever forms they present themselves? Do you confess Jesus Christ as your Savior, put your whole trust in his grace, and promise to serve him as your Lord in union with the church with Christ, which Christ is open to all people of all ages, nations, and races? According to the grace given to you, will you remain faithful, a faithful member of Christ's holy church and serve as Christ's representative in the world? And to you, church, because we do this in community, do you affirm as Christ's body, the church, reaffirm your, both your rejection of sin and your commitment of Christ? If so, say we do. And will you nurture one another in the Christian faith and life and include William now before you in your care? If so, say we will. Amen. William, I baptize you in the name of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. May by by the Spirit and water, may God make you whole so that you can be a faithful disciple of Christ to a world in need. Amen. Let's welcome William. As we sing our sing the next song, I invite you to come up through the middle aisle if you'd like to renew your baptism. It won't be a long formal thing but I'll place some water on your head and remind you of those words that were said at your baptism. Will you come? There's a sweet, sweet spirit in this place and I know that it's the spirit of the Lord. There are sweet 
expressions on each face and I know they feel the presence of the Lord sweet Holy Spirit sweet heavenly dove stay right here with us filling us with your and praise without a doubt we'll know that we have been revived when we shall leave this I guess it's my turn. <laughs> Take the cues from the screen. So, Dan, can I invite your family to come up here? Sure. Okay. So, Dan and his family, where are they? If y'all want to come up here, are joining our church today. They're making the commitment to uh, make this officially their church family. So, if, yeah, y'all can come up here. You want to introduce everyone? Dan, you want to introduce everyone? This is my wife, Kristen, my daughter, Katie, and my son, Drew. Katie would like to hide up here, I think. So <laughs> So we're glad that you were more complete because you are here with us. And we pray that you continue to offer your prayers, your presence, your gifts, your service, and your witness to God and to this community so that God may work in you. So if you, let's welcome the Davis family. Y'all can sit down. I know you want to sit down. They're sitting down as fast as they can. <laughs> if you're interested in joining our church and make, you've been baptized and you want to make the commitment to make this your church family, come see me afterwards. We'd love to do it. If you don't want to stand up in front of people, we can do that. Uh, but yeah, let's stand as we sing our last song.
To those of you going to the Rangers game, play ball. I think that's what you say. I don't do sports. <laughs> and then to all of you, may the Holy Spirit fill you so that you can be the hands and feet of Christ to those in need. Amen? Go in peace.